Here we're going to look a little bit at superposition, which describes how waves interact. So before we do that, we've got to be able to describe what phase difference is and identify it between waves or in a wave. We've got to look at standing waves and how they're formed, and then we can analyze how they're going to interact and superimpose over each other. First up, phase difference. So when a wave is traveling, it's displacing particles. Each particle along the wave is going to have a different displacement. The phase of a particle is the fraction of the complete cycle that the particle has passed through. Remembering that one complete cycle is, well, one whole wavelength. Okay? We usually measure this in radians, but we can also measure it in degrees. The phase difference of two particles is the fraction of a complete cycle or wavelength by which their motions are different. So, phase difference then. We usually measure this in radians, but we can also measure it in degrees. So remembering that two pi radians make up 360 degrees. Okay, And we can think about the wave traveling as something called a phaser. So two examples here. So two waves, both in phase here, obviously with different amplitudes. Whereas in this one, we've got two waves that are 90 degrees out of phase. Okay or pi over 2 radians. In this wave we have 180 degree pi radians out of phase. So using this then we can see how two waves are going to interact and simply put the waves just add or subtract together. So we've now seen some examples of waves in and out of phase. Okay, So now to see what happens when they're traveling towards and away from each other. So in this example we can see two waves meeting and traveling in opposite directions. The dotted lines clearly showing the waves when they're interacting. Okay, You can see quite clearly that as the waves approach each other, they start to superpose on top of each other. Okay, And simply enough, the waves just add together. They're vectors sum. Here, two waves traveling in the same direction, it's still exactly the same. If we pinpoint one specific point in time and stopped it, it would just be adding the two waves together to give the resultant. Just showing you a still here to show you how to do it. Now if they are completely in phase, clearly the resultant is going to have a bigger amplitude. Okay, So here we've got a red and a blue wave, same amplitude, same phase, same frequency, and we can see that the resultant has twice the amplitude of the original waves. When we have something like this, we have constructive interference, so the waves have added together. The converse is also true. So if the waves are pi radians out of phase, they will completely cancel each other out. We call this destructive interference. So to have a look at two examples then. In this first one, if we were to draw it, we would go along looking at each point. We'd notice here it would start to dip, but this wave is still at zero, essentially. And then the wave would start to superpose on top of each other. So we'd be left with something a little bit like that. Now looking at this example here, we've got one wave with a very long time period. Notice that the axis here is T. And one with a much shorter time period, and so a higher frequency. So these adding together, well, it's probably what you can imagine. We get that sort of formation. Now, formation of a stationary wave, or a standing wave. Standing wave is made when two progressive waves pass through each other and superposition occurs, so the points add together. Okay, And we get positions of no displacement, i.e. nodes, and points of well, maximum displacement, i.e. anti-nodes. Okay? These two waves here have the same wavelength and amplitude, and we're moving at equal but opposite velocities. This is the key thing needed to create a standing wave. You must have two waves with the same wavelength, the same amplitude, and equal but opposite velocities. Without this, the wave won't create a standing wave. Now, describing a standing wave. The amplitude of the vibrating particle in a stationary wave varies between the node at zero and a maximum at the antinode. If we think about a string that's fixed at both ends, 
could be a guitar string. If you pluck it, it starts to vibrate. Okay, in here there are nodes, and we can see that at a quarter of the time period, we've had a quarter of an oscillation. Another quarter, and we've had half an oscillation. So the wave will now be at the opposite point. Another quarter, it's back to its equilibrium position, and after one full time period, it's returned to the start position. So one complete wavelength. Okay. So looking then at some of the fundamental vibrations or overtones, remember this wave is still only fixed at the ends. Okay, the middle is free to move. If you think about this as if you're a guitarist, these are the harmonics that you can sometimes produce. So it'd be quite useful then to work out some properties of these standing waves. So if you think about our fundamental vibration, this first one, the wavelength is actually going to be twice this length. So the wavelength of this wave is actually twice this length. Using C equals F lambda, we can plug that in and we'll get the frequency is C over 2L. You can do a similar thing for every single overtone and we're left with, well, frequencies and wavelengths like this that we've worked out in class. Okay, Have a go and see if you can derive them yourself. It's not too difficult. Once you've worked out what the wavelength is, the rest just falls into place. The obvious example of a standing wave in the real world is musical instruments. So we have guitars to start with, which is a standing wave on a string, but we also have wind instruments and brass and etc. where they have standing waves in air. Now the important thing to note when working these out is that the end of the wave is actually an antinode. So up here we have an antinode. So in a pipe for example, if we're trying to create a sound, the standing wave that's produced, the first, the most fundamental one, will look like this. Okay, so we'll have a node at one end, an anti-node at the other one, and the length of this pipe will actually be a quarter of the total wavelength. Using C equals F lambda, if we've got lambda is four times this length, then we find that the frequency is the speed divided by 4L. So further overtones can be formed. A little bit more complicated than previously though. So this time, inside this length, we have three quarters of a wave okay so the wavelength of this wave is going to be four thirds times L now remember that in these diagrams the waves do not represent the particle movement okay these diagrams represent the amplitude of the particle oscillation because remember in sound the particle oscillates backwards and forwards because it's a longitudinal wave so to think about how those waves move, here's a little animation. So you can see here, these particles at the end, they've got the maximum amplitude because they're at an antinode. So they're oscillating around with the biggest amplitude, whereas the ones at the node aren't moving. For the first overtone then, we've got something that looks a bit like this. <laughs> 